with the strike of a light bulb. I just air it out and leave with the mic broke. The micro, I'm hard body like Tycho. Heavy metal Chevys with nitro. Addicted to the vapors of paper. Hypnotic to the thirst. I'm pulling off criminal capers. I know the cocaine crackery stinks, but that's what it is. Surrounded by the khakis and mints. We move. So welcome back to Developer Commentary. I'm Mike Stout. I'm Tony Garcia. And our guest today and I'm is Moo Yu. Yep, yeah, Moo Yu. And uh, today we're going to Aquados, which was a level that I designed, and I believe it was coded by uh, uh, Jared, I think. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, we haven't had Jared around. Hopefully, we'll be able to talk to Jared again uh, at some point, because he also has a wonderful, interesting perspective about this whole <laughs> wonderful game. So, uh, when we left off, we were talking to Moo very quickly about. Um, how he got into the industry. And I just want to touch on one quick thing before we start talking about Aquatos. Sure. Which was your level, Mike. And so we probably have a lot to get into here. But I just want to just wrap up a little bit of our conversation that we were having before. And my big question is, how big a shock to, was it to you, having been a fan of Ratchet & Clank before, to jump into how it was actually made and see... You know, you know, see behind the curtain, see what was going on. Yeah, was it like, was it like finally watching the sausage get made? <laughs> no, it it really wasn't. It was um, it was actually kind of you know really nice to see like how all of the pieces fit together, how a human team can actually make this kind of stuff. I think from the outside, you just sort of experience it, and you sort of get this impression that it's far too big for anyone to ever have any contributing part in. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think we prove like I really learned very quickly that anyone can have a huge contribution. I just think about, you know, Greg, who we mentioned earlier, you know, just came in as an intern and just added so much flavor to so many parts of the games. And that was just sort of the, the main thing I learned is like anyone can sort of have, you know, a large role in this kind of stuff. And was it intimidating at all to jump in and like to be like, oh, wow, here's something that I actually care a lot about. Like, I hope I don't screw it up and make this the worst <laughs> Ratchet and Clank game that's ever been made. Uh, yeah, definitely when I started, I was pretty paranoid. Uh, I didn't really know what I was doing. The way we coded it at school was very different from the way you code in the industry and that kind of stuff. So I was pretty nervous about that kind of stuff. But, eh, you know, you, you kind of you kind of get used to it. Man, okay, really quickly, now that I see these slime guys, I fucking hate these slime guys. <laughs> they are the worst thing. I had to do some work with them. We're about to get to probably... A part of this game that I had blo blocked out, but I'm only now having reminders of it. <laughs> Did you is... have to recover these guys from Ratchet One? <sighs> kind of. And so I did the sewer crystal stuff. Oh, and I know wow. there are people. I know there are people who are who are already saying I've done everything in this game that they've hated. <laughs> and this is not going to help my case at all. But I did some of the sewer crystal stuff, and I had to get the amoeboids working in the sewer crystal thing. And that is fucking horrible. Because when you hit them, they have to split into different locations. But in the sewer crystal pipes, they could be at any stupid orientation in these stupid little tiny corridors. And they still have to split and look not horrible. And that's so hard. It was such a pain in the ass to do that whole thing. And uh, I, oh, I don't think we're gonna just devo devote too much time on this commentary to the sewer crystal because I don't think there's enough interesting things to say about that super super long part of the game. Well, you but, you can just complain the whole time, maybe. Yeah, maybe we'll see what happens. But that's there's so much going on there. That's a rare uh, part of the game that both of us had something to do with, actually. So. Mike, you did you do the original design here on Aquados, or what was going on? What I did. was your this, role here? This is one of the first levels that uh, I actually started from a paper design, uh, and that I actually did all the enemy setups for. Uh, the biggest pain in the ass in this level was getting Skid McMarks to run through the level. It was madness. <laughs> he, uh, uh, so he's using the same system that the Battlefields and the, uh, the Galactic Rangers are using. So uh, if you'll remember, we said before, we don't have scripting in this game. We're not, uh, designers aren't capable of doing this kind of, uh, sort of thing. So basically poor Jared and, uh, and I had to set this up together so that Skid would run through here. And it was just like, if Skid didn't work, 
you couldn't get through the level. It was an A bug. It was it was awful. Uh, but uh, uh, design wise, I think uh, my biggest issue here was I sucked at making enemy placements. I was really bad at them, uh, just because I hadn't had a lot of experience with them yet. Right. Right. And so uh, uh, what what I did this time was I said, uh, Hey, Colin, because uh, Colin was good at enemy setups. If you design the enemy setups for me on this level, I'll totally design some puzzle segments for you on a different level. <laughs> so, so I basically took this level I was supposed to design and then ended up splitting it with Colin because uh, I was just so woefully inadequate at making enemy setups. So um, I don't remember this level at all. Like I'm, I'm just <laughs> looking through this and I don't recall anything that's going on right now. Like I remember Skid running around and doing the hacker stuff, but... This is all like seeing it again for the first time for me. It's so bizarre. Like I really blocked this whole thing out of my memory <laughs> because of the sewer pipe section. Uh, which is that in this level? I think so. It might not be. I can't remember. Oh fuck! I can't remember how to swim. <laughs> I think this is the only swimming section we have in the game. <laughs> it might be. Oh man. But uh, it was on the macro, so I had to I had to put it in. Right, one swimming traversal segment. Oh, here's some sewer pipes. Oh God, I remember oh, this. Begins. This is all weird. And then there's a mama tyranoid, I think that's gonna. Yeah, there we go. Or not tyranoid. Uh... Amoeboid. Yeah. Look how shiny he is. Well, that's I think that's this is that's the first... new tech. Yeah, we didn't have specular before, did we? Brand new next gen tech right there for Ratchet and Clank 3. <laughs> right on your PlayStation 2. Uh, so the main the main design requirement in this level, like when it was given to me, was that uh, it be about you know a, a member of the Q Force helping you get through the level. Because the whole big story thing in this game was that it was you know uh, you and the Q Force versus evil. It wasn't just Ratchet. He had a team like James Bond. Wait. Uh, yeah, the, the one recollection I have from this level is that I didn't really have a big role in it, but at the end, everyone pitched in to fix all kinds of bugs. But basically, whenever you died, getting Skid back to a reasonable point was just utterly insane. Oh, God, that sounds awful. Yeah, the amount of code that we had for all the different cases of where you could die and where you could respawn and Skid just not being in the right place or, uh, or his AI being in the wrong state was just mental. So, uh... When, uh, when I knew that we were going to have to have a guy running along with you, uh, what I really didn't want was to make a dork challenge, right? I didn't want you to have to protect Skid, because those always suck. I've never seen them done in a way that don't suck. Uh, so, basically, the, the thing was, the enemies attack you, they ignore Skid. Uh, way to die, I, Mike. Yeah, You way know what? Oh, God, all the way back at the beginning. Oh. Yeah, you should have... You should have paid more attention to the game, uh, unless to you bragging about how brilliant you are. And you, <laughs> and you should suck my balls. <laughs> right, but so you didn't want to make a door count challenge for obvious reasons. Yeah, it's uh, uh, I mean, they suck, right? Have have has anyone ever done them well? Uh, there's this little game I heard of called Eco. It's not bad. Oh, <laughs> uh, like I'm not actually joking. What the hell game is that? You don't know Eco? No, I've never even heard of it. Well, you're going to get some hate mail. I think. <laughs> is it... Maybe I'm mispronouncing it for you, Ico? It's... Oh, okay. I know, I know Ico. I never played it, but I know it. Uh... Yeah, you're j getting just as much hate mail then. Yeah, exactly. How d how dare you be a game developer I'm gonna... who hasn't played Ico? I'm going to go a little step further and say that I didn't play Shadow of the Colossus because I heard it was terrible. Oh. So uh, well, you're... send me more hate mail, everybody. Yeah, please, take it off of me for doing the sewer pipes and send it to Mike for not playing these brilliant games. You, you know what, Tony? Why make our fans choose? Why can't they just send us both hate mail? No, one, one or the other. That's the way it goes. <laughs> All right, you heard it first, guys. Oh, yeah, uh, so, uh, I mean, we can get back into it. They, yeah, escort missions are, at, le at the very least, difficult to do well. I'll, I'll stipulate that, yeah. They're difficult. Uh, and uh, ultimately frustrating when, uh, because if if you feel like the the, the non-player character you're protecting 
is not doing anything to stop getting brutalized, then it feels like the game is just screwing you over. It's cheating. Right. So there's a really high bar on the AI. And as I mentioned, we had practically no ability to do anything <laughs> with Skid's AI. So uh, it, it wasn't really an option for us to even try to do an escort challenge well. Right. Which, for some reason, we called dork challenges at Insomniac. I, I, I don't... It was along the, you know, uh, with the with the word kludge and uh, a few other things that I've never heard or uh, hero collision. I've never heard anyone else say that. I've 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 taken that terminology to other places I've gone because ah, it's a wonderful fuck. bit of terminology. I don't know how to swim, <laughs> Mike. You're absolutely terrible at this. Uh, remember the thing about my balls? You can do that again. So really quickly, uh, that Moo brought up something before uh, about how we were all pitching in to do bugs at the end of the project. Moo was actually giving me a run for my money in terms of bug count a little bit on this game. Not in terms of bugs that he entered, but at least in terms of bugs that he fixed uh, on this game, which was yeah, interesting. I, mean, I think nothing compares to the one night. Um, I think Tony fixed somewhere around 100 or 200 bugs in one night. I don't know. Probably um, that sounds. But yeah, reasonable. we 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 were all there, you know, pretty late, and by pretty late, I mean on to the next day. Um, but yeah, we we sort of got an influx of bugs. Um, yeah, from from I guess you know key stakeholders finally had a chance to you know review everything and yeah. in their you know five hour playthrough wrote somewhere about four or five hundred bugs. Oh, man, I, I think remember 150 that. of which went to Tony. <laughs> oh, I remember that night. I remember that well, where we just got pages and pages of excel spreadsheets was that your uh uh three day in a row stay yeah that was that was that whole section do you want to I, I believe it was during this game do you want to tell the story of your three day stay because i I, re not, I might remember it better than you do uh, yeah you can go ahead but i uh, there's really not too much to tell i mean we like Moo said that uh the leads and ted one day decided to get through and just play through the game uh, when we were well on into development, um, I mean, it had to be about ha at least halfway into the project, right? Maybe around there. Yeah, I think it was right after Alpha. I think we oh. were about to have our first play test. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just like, you know, and this was one of the first games because a lot of the key principles had moved, like, as we said a couple times before, had moved on to Resistance. And that was sort of where their focus was on for a good part of the development here. And so they decided to just like, all right, well, let's go look at the game and see where things need to get fixed. And there were a lot of things that needed to get fixed. If I remember and correctly, this game was a disaster until two weeks before Gold. Uh, I think that's fair. Yeah. I think that's a fair thing to say. I remember going out to lunch with the designers and all of us just like, we're, you know, we're, we're putting like uh, earthquake blankets over each other and try, you know, trying not to cry. And uh, I think Colin said... I'm really worried that we will make Insomniac's first failure. And uh, and then, like two weeks later, it was the highest rated game Insomniac's ever made. So it just goes to show what two weeks can do. Yeah. How did, how did that feel, Moo? To have people saying that they were afraid they were going to make the biggest failure on your first game. <laughs> I, I didn't hear nice. that part. Um, oh. Yeah, I didn't really hear it from them. I just sort of just, I think at that point in the project, I wasn't probably feeling a whole lot. I was just <laughs> just loading up my bug list, counting bugs, and trying to get the number lower. Did you ever have that sort of fear when you were going into it? Like, you know, this was like this is my first thing. I have to make sure it's excellent and it's not up to my standards. Did that ever occur to you at all? Or, um, I th I think there was you know a little bit of fear on that kind of stuff. But you know, when you sort of get into it, you get too close and you sort of don't realize you know what you're working on and what the quality is anymore. It's just like. All you see is just the pain of a million bugs. You know, like every single time you load the game, you're just like trying to avert your eyes from the obvious bugs at that given point in time. So it's 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 hard to be objective. Yeah, for sure. The the one thing that just keeps popping out to me, I don't know if you guys have talked about this, is the orange HUD. Um, <laughs> I remember we, we talked a we little about the orange it, HUD. But I, I know you're so passionate about this, so I'm glad you're here. And please yeah. talk about the orange shot. I, I remember one of the reviews we got, which was a perfect score, and they said this is they, they effectively said this is basically a perfect game, except for the HUD. <laughs> it's far too orange. 
Uh, and, um, uh, and it's hard for me to remember what my role was in the HUD. I, I, I remember Ricardo was primarily on all UI stuff. Right. But I definitely know at the end, there was one day that I was just not in a very good mood. And they brought brought this o- over like this sort of user review of like the HUD. And it was like a 60-some page document that someone had written up about the problems with the HUD. And and yeah, it was it was, it was not a fun experience. Oh. And, I know uh, you were very passionate about how the HUD was designed because, I mean, what you had done before was all UI stuff, right? And so yeah. you had a lot, actually, a lot of experience doing UI, even though you hadn't done a lot of games. So you were one of the most vocal critics of, you know, we need to do this HUD better. Like this is how we should. I mean, even back, even the back end engineering of the HUD, you had a lot of opinions about how the HUD should be engineered. And you had, and you, and you sat next to poor Ricardo who was doing the HUD. <laughs> Yeah, poor Ricardo. I mean, it was, you know, like like all the other pieces of, you know, games development, I think there wasn't an sufficient planning up front and sort of just as you go along and you, you know, you get really ambitious and then you, you cut really far back and you just keep sort of, you know, going bipolar on these kinds of things. It's sort of this crazy experience. If I, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, pretty much every HUD programmer we had sort of went insane near the end of the project. And, uh, so uh, we had Jason on Ratchet One, and uh, I think right like he was he was about to leave uh, Insomniac, and Ricardo was going to replace him, and he told Ricardo, "Now I understand why people drink." <laughs> well, no, he... and then uh, Ricardo came up to me at the end of uh, uh, you know one of the long days on this project, and he said, "Mike, now I understand why Jason understood why people drink." <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a it's a difficult place to be to do the hud especially since nobody cares about the hud until the very end when you have to redo everything right uh, yeah and, and the, the worst part about it is like you're never going to get any praise like even if you made the the best hud in the universe at the end people are going to say oh that's the guy that drew rectangles on screen <laughs> uh and if i remember correctly the hud was a nice blue color to start with and then it turned into the kind of unreadable orange later on well, blue was the last. That was Ratchet and Clank two, right? Right. So we were just using the standard Ratchet and Clank two colors, and then you know we we're like, oh, we need to make, we need to differentiate the HUD a little bit more, and uh, there was a long debate about what color the HUD should be, and I know everybody felt very very strongly about you know what what the HUD needs to look like. Ooh, depth of field. Look at that. Another next gen effect oh. brought to you on the PlayStation two. So we were talking about the night you stayed three nights in a row. Yeah, we mentioned it. Yeah, so what was to get just really quickly, uh, we got this super long, ridiculous list of these are every, this is everything that's wrong in the game and it needs to get fixed. And it was an impossibly long list, like the kind of list you look at and you're like, this I I don't know how this is ever going to get done. And so I just looked at it and I was like, you know what? God damn it! I'm gonna sit down. I'm gonna buckle up. And I'm going to get this list done. And I'm just going to work until my list is empty. And that was basically 72 hours of sitting at my desk, just hammering out bugs, trying to get my, you know, all my stuff off that list. And uh, by the end of it, Ted came up to me, and it was like a Wednesday morning, and Ted came up to me and he's like, how long have you been here? And I like (laughs) stopped for a second and I was like, what day is it? And he's like, "Go home, go home right now." <laughs> yeah, that's a story. That's a story I tell to people as a cautionary tale. Yeah, I, it, it's so hard to drift into it, though. I remember, you know, one of the early birds was John Fiorito, um, and the number of times that you were just coding and coding and coding, and then suddenly John Fiorito walks back in, and you realize, "Wow, I've been here all night, haven't I?" Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Oh man.